السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The smallness of means, the greatness of the aim and stupendous results. If these three things are the marks of greatness, then who can compare anyone with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sharafil anbiyai wal mursaleen. Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathiran kathira Fahma badu That is how the economy worked That is how they collected so many gods Then I talked to you about financial instruments How did that happen? It happened because now I am going imagine I am Supposing I am a merchant of the Quraysh and I am going to Syria To buy stuff I need to carry cash. How will I buy stuff? Now, what is cash in those days? It is not uh, US dollar, $20 bills which are printed by the Federal Reserve uh, without any backing whatsoever. It's just money. It's just paper which is printed. And the reason that paper is used is valued because of the US Army, not because of the paper has any backing, right? These were the days of gold and silver. That's it. So no matter what stamp you had on it, it was a gold coin. It, it had intrinsic value. It was a silver coin. Now, what is the upside of a gold and silver coin it has intrinsic value what is the downside of it it's heavy it is ungainly it is heavy it is inconvenient to carry right supposing somebody says i'm going to give you a million dollars in gold you are in trouble man you need a truck to carry that thing whereas currency one note enough that is why they developed their banking instruments and as I said they didn't develop the instrument these were done these were used for centuries before that for a thousand years before the Arabs started using them these were already in use that is what the Jews did they traded across boundaries the Roman Empire is responsible for creating a, a world where people traded across boundaries which were national boundaries which were racial boundaries which were tribal so you had the Goths and you had the Gauls uh, and you had the Celts in, uh, in Britain, right? You had the Italians who were the Romans. Uh, you had uh, these people, they were trading between each other. How? In this way. By paper. So somebody gave you, so I'm now going from here to Syria. I don't have to worry about carrying, you know, a camel load of gold. And then camel load of gold means now I'm the target of anyone who is hunting. So I don't have to put myself in danger. I don't have to have the inconvenience of carrying all this, all this gold and silver. All I do is I take a paper and this paper is to somebody there to say, pay this person so much. So buying on credit, what we call letters of credit, what we call LCs and so on and so forth, uh, checks, all kinds of financial instruments were common in use. With the Arabs. I sometimes say that if you brought one of them, if you brought, say, Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, if you brought Abu Sufyan, uh, if you brought, uh, brought uh, you know, Abu Lahab, people like this, uh, Abu Talib, if you brought these people today into one of our global banks, believe me, they would not be surprised. I mean, they would be surprised to have, uh, to see air conditioning and to see, you know, computer systems and LCD panels, but as far as the banking systems were concerned, they would be very familiar. They would not be. They wouldn't be. They would not be seeing stars in the day because they. These were systems that they also used. Now, in that in that whole uh, milieu came Islam, came Rasulullah sallam, and he said <coughs> that Allah subhanahu wa taala does not prevent you from earning money. Allah does not prevent you from becoming wealthy. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you how to earn that money and where to spend it. You will earn that money in a way which is non-exploitary, um, which does not exploit anybody, non-oppressive, which does not oppress anybody. You will earn that money in a way where you are not taking away or infringing or violating the rights of others. You will earn that money in a way which, where you are not deceiving people. 
you are not lying and cheating and by all means earn the money by all means enjoy that money but spend that money in a way which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning spend that money in a way which is productive spend it in a way which relieves the suffering of people spend it in a way which is positive now what do you call these things which I mentioned halal and what is the opposite of that haram so halal and haram is not just some uh, term in fiqh halal is anything which is beneficial anything which is clean anything which is intrinsically good and haram is the opposite of that somebody asked me once uh, in uh, america when i was speaking at the university of massachusetts uh, they said they said what is the sharia law uh, what is sharia law i said to them sharia law is the way in which any moral ethical responsible citizen would like to live that's it any moral ethical and responsible these are the three to me the three criteria of uh, of good people they must be moral they must be ethical and they must be they must act responsibly so anyone who's living in that way is following the sharia law whether he whether he or she is a muslim or not whether they call it sharia it doesn't matter forget the name effectively you are doing good stuff you are not harming anybody you are trying to benefit everybody alhamdulillah this was the religion of all the prophets who came this is the religion of abraham this is the religion of moses this is the religion of jesus this is the religion of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam wa alihi musallam this is the religion of all the anbiya or alihi musallam who came from the first from adam alaihi salam to the last and final of them muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam after whom there is no rasul and there is no nabi this is the religion right so do you understand this whole situation as far as money is concerned what nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught now the most important lesson about money that i want to uh, remind myself and teach you why is money important at all believe me i am not one of them who considers uh, to me poverty is uh, highly unromantic i mean it's a, it's not something to be sought after simplicity in living is different from poverty simplicity in living is a choice poverty is not a choice you understand what i'm saying it doesn't mean that if you have money that you must splurge it and you must waste it no of course you must not do that there is a famous story of this man who came to nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he asked him for some charity so rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent him to usman bin affan radhiyallahu anhu he said go to usman you ask him to help you tell him that i sent you and he will help you so this man went to sayyidina usman bin affan radhiyallahu anhu's house by the time he reached there it was almost dusk it was evening um as the man stood outside the door and is about to knock on the door he hears a voice from inside sayyidina uthman radhiyallahu anhu speaking to his wife and he is telling her lower the wick lower the flame of the lamp because it is burning too much of oil this man is standing there about to knock he hears this voice so the man thinks to himself he said what kind of person did rasulullah send me to this man is worried about the oil in his lamp what is he going to give me right what will he give me so he thought what is the point even in knocking on the door what is the point in asking for anything because i am not going to get anything from this person so let me go home he turned around and started walking back and then he thought to himself well you know since rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent me to this man maybe there is some hikmat of the rasul so let me go and knock on the door and ask him what's the worst that can happen so he turned around went back he knocked on the door said and usman opened the door and he said to him he salam and then he said rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent me to you and i need some help i am uh, very poor so please help me said and usman radhiyallahu anhu said to him please wait he went inside he got a bunch of keys he took him to his warehouse he opened the door of the warehouse 
and he said to the man, go inside, take whatever you want, however much you want. And when you are leaving, here are the keys, lock it and give me the keys. And he walked away. Now this man, his eyes are open, his jaw is dropped. He said, what kind of thing is this? So he called out. Sayyidina Osman turned and he said, what happened? He said, no, no, please, I have to ask you a question. He said, what question? He said, you know, as I came to your house just now, I overheard you speaking to your wife and you were telling her to lower the wick of the lamp because it burns too much of oil. So I thought to myself, what kind of a stingy man is this that he, he is worried about the oil of his lamp? What can he give me? He said, anyway, since Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent you, sent me, I turned around and I came. And now when I ask you for charity, he's not asking for a loan. He's asking for something to take away. He said, when I'm asking for charity, you are opening your warehouse and you're telling me take whatever you like. I said, what is this? How do I understand these two things? Sayyidina Asma Minafar said, what is so difficult to understand? He said, what is difficult to understand? It's very simple. He said, the oil belongs to me. I am using it for myself. Allah will question me about that. So I am concerned about how much I am using. He said, this I am spending for the sake of Allah. Whatever I give you, Allah will give me return. So what do I care? Take as much as you want. The more you take, the benefit for me. Huh? So Islam does not stop you from earning money. Islam merely tells you how to earn it and where to spend it. And that's the reason why it is so important to teach this to your children right from day one. I tell people, teach them about money, help them understand what is money. Number two, when you give them pocket money, teach them budgeting. Tell them they have to prepare a monthly budget. And then sit with them and look at this budget. What was your income? Where did you spend it? Look at the heads under which they spent it and see if they spend something on charity. And if they spend something on charity, you tell them, well, whatever you spend on charity, I will replace that. I will give you more. Help them understand the meaning of charity. Otherwise, what, what, what do most children, what do they do? They take the money and they're just buying stuff with it. Teach them earning. Tell them, okay, charity is one thing. Did you invest any of this money? Did you make this money make you more money? It's not just a matter of saying buying chocolates, buying this, buying that. I No. I have this money, whatever it is, right? I got $20. There's a famous story, I don't know if it's true or not, but there's a famous story of this man who went to Microsoft looking for a job. So the recruiting officer, he said to him, please uh, write down your CV. So he wrote down his whatever it was. And the man said, what's your email? He said, I don't have an email. He said, if you don't have an email, we can't hire you because we need, you must have an email, we, you know, for, for you to. He said, I have no computer. This was the days before smartphones. I've got no phone or, I mean, that didn't come into the conversation. He said, I don't have a computer. I don't have an email. The man said, sorry, then we can't give you a job. So now he left. All he had in his pocket was $20. So as he left, he is walking down the street, he sees this grocery store and they are selling tomatoes. So there's a box of tomatoes, which is for $20. So his man goes and buys one box of tomatoes. He carries his tomatoes on his, on his shoulder and he goes house to house. Do you need some tomatoes? Yes, well, here are some tomatoes. And he is selling the same box of tomatoes, which he bought for $20. $20. At the end of the day, he sold it for $40 because he's selling one tomato by, you know, at a time or something. This he continued to do. So he's, sell, he's buying and he's selling, he's making a profit. All of this is cash money. Over time, this business built up. The man started, he started shops, he started uh, so on, and then transportation, he started getting, you know, logistics, uh, trucks, and this and that. He became a billionaire. He had a huge business. He became the tomato king of America. And what was he originally wanting to do? 
So somebody asked him, he said, how did you do this? So he told him the story. So the man said, uh, now imagine, imagine if you had got a job in Microsoft. He said, yeah, I would have been a janitor because that was the job I applied for. If I got a job in Microsoft, I would have been a janitor. Instead, I'm now a, a, a multi-billionaire with this king. So the point is, what was he doing? He was using money in a positive way. So when you give your children pocket money, teach them this. As I said, you don't have to give them hundreds and thousands of, of dollars. Ten dollars, twenty dollars, whatever it is. Right? Pocket money? Ask them. Make a budget. Where do you plan to spend this? Then ask them questions. How about this twenty dollars at the end of this month, instead of asking me for next month's allowance, you reimburse me. How about you tell me I don't need an allowance any longer because I'm making my own allowance. But the problem with, with uh, wealthy, especially Muslims, may Allah forgive us. We train our children to become losers. Losers. We train them to become losers because you only teach them to spend. Do not teach them to learn, to earn. You do not teach them responsibility. I've got, I've got friends, uh, you know, and, and I know people in different parts of the world who are very wealthy. I've got friends I know and I won't name the country and so on because then, you know, people see these videos and I don't want them to feel bad. But I know, I know friends where the child, if he gets anything less than a BMW, he considers it to be an insult to his dignity. What is that? Huh? And then, these are big business people, big, big, big business families. There's a book of mine called The Business of Family Business. I, I consult with family businesses. Uh, one, of the, one of the core areas of my consultancy is, is uh, succession planning. So several times or many times, the young, the second or third generation which is there, the youngsters, uh, they come to me and they say, please, my father does not want to give me freedom, my father won't let me, uh, you know, run the company and so on, so can you recommend to, the, to my father? But you recommend on what basis? Because all that you do are, is you spend money. So one of them I told him that was the first time that the X5 came out, BMW, and this guy was, was, you know, was dying for an X5. So I told him, why don't you tell your dad? I said, I will tell your dad to give you the money to buy an X5. Right? Take the money, buy a Toyota Corolla. Don't buy a BMW X5. Buy a Toyota Corolla. The rest of the money which you save, I said, invest that money, grow it, and next year, give your father a X5 as a gift. And I said, I guarantee you, your father will give you the keys to the safe. Because you have proven to him that you know how to handle money. Because right now, you are a parasite. I said, I'm sorry to... Yeah, I, I tell them, I say, I'm sorry to, you know, be, to be rude, but you are a parasite. I mean, all you do is suck, 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 blood, blood, blood. I mean, I, you expect your parents to, to be happy about that? You expect them to, to hand over the whole thing to you? So you make them at the tail end of their lives when they are retiring, when they are old, you want them to beg on the street because you ran through the whole fortune? No way. No way. They are, they are, they are smart. I said, your dad is not a fool, believe me. The old man has got brains. He doesn't have enough brains, otherwise you would not be like the way you are. He should have had these brains much earlier. So you are part of his, uh, you know, part of his mistake, but at least now he recognizes the mistakes. So he doesn't want to perpetuate it. So I, I tell them, I tell them, if you feel bad, no problem, that's good, feel bad. Then you, at least you will correct yourself. Teach them about money, about being responsible about money. Earn halal. Spend halal and be responsible. Islam does not prevent you from being rich. Rasulullah said, Allah likes the one 
whose hand is above more than the one whose hand is below. So Alhamdulillah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you and you are one of those who gives, you will inshallah be from the people of Jannah because you are spending, you are investing in your akhirah. Right? So this is what the <coughs> system was and I, as, as we know, <coughs> in the fundraising of Tabuk, for example, see the orientation of the Sahaba with regard to um, spending. People brought and gave whatever they had to give. Whatever they had, they brought and they gave. And the finest of them was Abu Bakr Siddiq who came and gave everything he had. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, what have you left for your family? He said, Allah and his Nabi are sufficient for my family. Now, having said that, Islam, th this is people doing more than what is required. These are the Sabi Khun al These are the people who are the role models. But Islam does not, the Quran is very clear. The Quran says, do not give until you have your hand is tied to your neck. So, Islam does not say give away everything and then you become a beggar yourself. No. By all means, spend on your family. By all means, have some savings. By all means, keep some money. But, also spend and spend in a significant way because you see that spending as an investment in your own akhirah. I sometimes ask people, and these are not questions, I'm not asking these to criticize them. I'm just asking them to... Uh, give them some food for thought. I ask people who are charitable people, who are giving charity not in tens or hundreds, not even in thousands, but in hundreds of thousands. I'm talking to people who are giving charity in hundreds of thousands, in zakat as well as other than zakat. My single question to them is, this year did you give charity equal to the price of the car that you drive? You're driving a Land Cruiser. Did you, did you give your charity equal to the price of a Land Cruiser? You're driving a Range Rover. Did you give charity equal to the price of a Range Rover? No. You didn't. Not even close. So, Alhamdulillah, what you are giving is good for you. Alhamdulillah. Your Range Rover is also halal for you. Your Land Cruiser also is halal for you. No problem. But put it in perspective in your own mind. Put it in perspective in your own mind. Please understand, I named for you cars which are also utility vehicles. They are, they are cars which you probably actually use. Right? I'm not talking about Ferraris. I'm not talking about Bentleys. I'm not talking about Rolls Royce. Because Rolls Royce is not transportation. Yeah. A Rolls Royce is inna mal hayatu dunya illa mata'ul ghurur. It's like people who buy a watch to tell the time and somebody buys a watch to tell the world. And how do you know the difference? By their body language. You know the person who, the person who, you have to tell you seriously, a person who buys a watch, who wears a watch to tell the world, you know what they do? Every once in a while they'll do this. <laughs> like this. So this sleeve will come down and you can see the watch. Because what is the good of me wearing a watch when you can't see it? Because my whole idea is not the time. Eh? My, my, so, <laughs> the body language, <laughs> the body language tells you, tells it all, right? 